Hello, I'm Eric Strong, a hospitalist from Stanford University, and this is Strong Medicine. There has been a lot of talk online in the last month about artificial intelligence, and in particular about OpenAI's chatbot, ChatGPT. For those of you not familiar, let me ask ChatGPT to describe itself. ChatGPT is a variant of the GPT language model developed by OpenAI. GPT is a machine learning model that has been trained on a large data set of human-generated text in order to generate natural-sounding text that is similar to human writing. ChatGPT is specifically designed to be used in chatbots and conversational systems with the goal of generating human-like responses to user inputs in a chat or messaging context. People have been exploring all kinds of interesting ways to use it, some for productivity and a lot for entertainment. One of the more discussed issues surrounding ChatGPT is its impact on education. Specifically, will this make it too easy for students to cheat with tasks like writing essays? The depth of analysis the bot displays is relatively superficial, so it probably won't score you any A's in a college course, but for a mid-tier high school student tasked with writing a short essay on a broad or common topic, it may be good enough. Another concern is that since every output from ChatGPT is original, it makes it impossible to catch cheating unless you call a young or subpar student out for their paper being too good for them to have plausibly written themselves. In short, having this technology openly available to everyone complicates assessments. Which brings us to medical school. I've wondered whether or not it could be used successfully in our courses here at Stanford. Specifically, could ChatGPT pass a final exam for a med school course on clinical reasoning? There have been a handful of groups that have shown chatbots like ChatGPT to do relatively well with US MLE board style questions. But those are relatively succinct and focused with a question stem that's typically a single paragraph. To understand how difficult our school's exams would be for a chatbot, I need to spend a few minutes discussing what specifically clinical reasoning is. If you're a medical professional yourself, feel free to skip ahead about 90 seconds. Clinical reasoning is a collection of cognitive processes which a clinician uses to analyze a patient's symptoms and physical exam findings in order to hypothesize possible diagnoses, select appropriate confirmatory tests, interpret those test results, refine hypotheses, and ultimately recommend treatment options to the patient. It involves book knowledge of medical science, familiarity with the medical literature, application of biostatistics, usually qualitatively, a consideration of the cost and risks from both tests and treatments, and at the more advanced levels, an integration of the patient's values and preferences. It is a complex, multifaceted science of its own, one that is very patient-focused, and something that every practicing doctor does on a routine basis. One of the more common ways we test clinical reasoning skills is to have students analyze written cases, designed and curated to have a degree of ambiguity and complexity appropriate for their stage of training. In a typical exam, you know, at least here at Stanford, the student is provided information in increments asked about the possible diagnoses at various points, and then occasionally given other clinically oriented tasks such as concise, uh, concisely summarizing a case or crafting a formal problem list for the patient. When it comes to the actual test I administered to ChatGPT, I gave it a two case exam that we currently use as a practice exam for our students at the end of their first year. I copied and pasted the case and question stems into the chatbot's prompt exactly as they are written out for the students, with the exceptions of writing out some acronyms and changing the format of lists into prose, for example, a medication list. Also, the bot is not able to analyze images, so for chest x-rays and tables of labs that the students would normally be expected to interpret separately, I gave the bot the most basic objective interpretation of them and excluded a couple related questions in the grading. This practice exam is given during the student's organ blocks in cardiovascular and respiratory pathology, so they deliberately have a strong cardiopulmonary focus. The first case is a 29-year-old man 
who presented with fever and difficulty breathing. The case walks us through the progression of his symptoms, along with a bunch of information about his family and personal life. Then there's a thorough physical exam presented in standardized medical language. And after all of that, after hundreds and hundreds of words, the question is posed, what are the four most likely diagnoses? The bot's first three diagnoses are spot on and would be included in my own answer of four. Influenza, COVID, and pneumonia. Its fourth diagnosis, bronchitis, is a little bit of a stretch given the degree of hypoxemia. So in this particular case, it gets a half a point for that particular answer. The bot is then asked what tests should be ordered at this time to help better determine his diagnosis. Its response includes a CBC or complete blood count, a metabolic panel that includes electrolytes and kidney function, liver function tests, thyroid tests, a throat swab, tests for flu and COVID, a chest x-ray, and pulmonary function tests. This response is a little bit weaker. It would get credit for the CBC metabolic panel uh, tests for flu and COVID and the chest x-ray. Now, some docs would also get blood cultures, a blood gas, and or a D-dimer at this point, none of which it mentioned, but also none of which were definitely indicated. A bigger error, in my, in my opinion, was including thyroid and pulmonary function tests, neither of which are justifiable at this point. Based on the predetermined rubric, this question would get scored 5 out of 7 points. Then some test results are provided, followed by a request to revise the differential diagnosis, with a commitment to one leading diagnosis and two alternative hypotheses, including evidence for and against each. The bot has determined that this patient has pneumonia, citing the patient's symptoms, lung findings on exam, his hypoxemia, leukocytosis, and chest x-ray. The question stem is a little tricky because there aren't really any features in this case which argue, uh, argue strongly against pneumonia, but the bot still lists lack of travel, animal exposure, or insect bites. None of these features actually impact the probability, but at the same time, it's possible that the bot was forced to come up with something since the question does ask for it. With a human test taker, in this situation, they usually respond that there are no inconsistent features for which they would receive full credit, which you know may seem like a trick question to someone that's not uh, experienced with these types of questions and these types of exams. The plausible alternatives are given as COVID and pneumonia. In this particular case, the test results don't suggest many changes to the list of diagnoses one would consider after just the history and exam. And you know that that's sort of what I would conclude as well. Overall, 15 out of 16 for this question, losing a point because of the bizarre connection to animals and insects. And last, the bot is asked to provide a problem list for the patient. In extreme brief, problem lists in medicine are uh, lists of every symptom, exam, in the lab abnormality, diagnosis, chronic medical problem, and any aspect of their social and family history, which reasonably could be expected to influence their health at, uh, at this point in time or at some point in the future. Problem lists are meant to be thorough and prioritized with the most serious and acute issues listed first. Usually the top problem is, usually, uh, is a suspected diagnosis. And any elements that are clearly part of the same problem you know, it should be lumped together. So here the bot falters a bit. The first three problems are the three leading and somewhat competing diagnoses, rather than just including the leading one. Or alternatively, what sometimes people do is uh, the top problem could be framed as something like acute respiratory infection, if you weren't really sure which infection the patient had at that point in time. Now the bot does appropriately list these first, suggesting it's prioritizing properly, but then it also fails to lump highly linked problems together. For example, respiratory alkalosis, and an elevated white blood cell count, they don't need to be listed separately from pneumonia. Also within the case, it mentioned that the patient consumes three to four alcoholic drinks per day, and that their body mass index was high at 30, both of which should be represented in the problem list. So overall, this, uh, although this would be a really sad looking problem list for an experienced medical resident, for a first year student, it's not totally awful and per the rubric, would get 7 out of 12. So in total, for this first case, ChatGPT scores 30.5 out of 39 points for 78%. I'm not going to go through the second case in nearly as, as much detail, but just in extreme brief, it's a 72-year-old man with a history of hypertension and smoking who presented with shortness of breath for two weeks. 
The intended diagnosis for the case is lung cancer complicated by a malignant pleural effusion. The bot uh, did not do so well with this case. For example, when interpreting the patient's exam, it completely missed the enlarged firm cervical lymph node, uh, which was mentioned, uh, which should have been a red flag for malignancy. And thus the bot actually never ends up mentioning lung cancer at all. Where the bot really shined on this case was with the request for a concise summary. I'm going to read the case summary it provided to show you how impressive it was. The patient is a 72-year-old man with a history of hypertension, smoking, and a previous hospitalization for COVID-19. He presents with shortness of breath for two weeks, which has gradually worsened and now occurs with mild exertion. His physical exam reveals fatigued appearance, asymmetric lung expansion, dullness to percussion in absent breath sounds on the left side, a regular tachycardia, and a two out of six systolic murmur. A chest x-ray shows a large left pleural effusion. Routine lab tests are only notable for mild anemia. The patient's symptoms, physical exam findings, and imaging result suggest the possibility of pneumonia, heart failure, or a pleural effusion. So once again, it didn't mention the suspicious lymph node, uh, which is a, a big miss. And it offered a pleural effusion as a potential diagnosis, despite it being a manifestation of a disease rather than a disease itself. But otherwise, it did a really good job at synthesizing the case's most important features into a coherent and concise narrative. And to be honest, it provided a summary that would be about average for a first-year medical student. Another place where the bot did surprisingly well this time was the request to create a problem list. It does start the list off poorly with the same mistake as with case one, listing the competing diagnoses it was considering as if they were separate problems. But the rest of the list is nearly perfect, with my only other criticism being the prioritization with poor diet and severe obesity listed below the hip replacement, family history and occupational exposure to chemicals, despite them being more important issues overall. So for the second case, the bot would have scored a 66%. Putting these two cases together, ChatGPT scored a 72% on this clinical reasoning exam for first-year medical students, in which our passing threshold would be 70. So, a chatbot passed a med school final, just barely. I've subsequently entered in more cases from our, our repository of clinical reasoning exams and created some original vignettes and original cases to identify its shortcomings. The results have been similar. Responses from ChatGPT vary from missing critical details and failing to make connections in complex cases involving interactions between multiple organs, while for cases that are more straightforward, the bot gives responses that are at the level of a typical first or second year student. This led me to the next question. How would ChatGPT do in real life? The cases that we use in first and second year exams are not real cases. You know, they do include distractors with lots of irrelevant details, but at the same time, there are relatively few features that are directly inconsistent with the patient's intended diagnosis. For cases that include multiple acute problems, the problems are all directly linked through some well-described pathophysiologic process. The intended diagnoses are never rare diseases, but in real life, patients can present with multiple simultaneous unrelated, and uncommon problems. And presentations are often not consistent with what we've been taught in medical school. As is sometimes said, patients don't read the textbook. So how can we test ChatGPT's ability to reason through an actual, complicated, real-world case? I pulled the five most recent case reports with diagnostic dilemmas published in the New England Journal of Medicine. I fed each case in its entirety into a single prompt and then asked for the most likely diagnosis. These cases are not only more complicated than those used in our exams, they are also longer, averaging around 1,000 words each. Here's how the bot did. Case 1, a 59-year-old man presented with a three-week history of fatigue, lightheadedness, and a gradually worsening bifrontal headache. The bot's diagnosis was autoimmune hemolytic anemia, the actual diagnosis was TTP. So vaguely the right ballpark, but not nearly close enough. So 0 for 1. 
Case two, an 11 year old girl with redness of the eyes. The bot's response was that she had intermediate uveitis, but that the information provided was insufficient to speculate a specific cause. The actual diagnosis was sarcoidosis. So 0 for 2. Case 3. A 30-year-old woman with decreased vision and headache. The bot said optic neuritis. The actual diagnosis, an optic nerve sheath meningioma. 0 for 3. Case 4. A 55-year-old man with fatigue, weight loss, and pulmonary nodules. Despite multiple attempts to revert the request, the bot would not commit to a single most likely diagnosis. The actual diagnosis was tuberculosis, so 0 for 4. And last, the most recent case was a 21-year-old woman with fatigue and weight gain. The bot predicted an adrenal adenoma, while the actual diagnosis was an adrenal cortical carcinoma. That's close, but not correct. However, in real life, the pre-biopsy clinical diagnosis by a Harvard expert was also an adrenal adenoma. So while the bot technically got it wrong, I'm going to give it credit for this one. Overall, with real-life cases from MGH and Harvard, ChatGPT did relatively poorly, but we need to keep in mind that these cases are selected by the New England Journal of Medicine partially because of their complexity. From all the cases I've given to the bot, trying to understand its strengths and weaknesses in medical, uh, making medical diagnosis, here's a summary of what I've observed its strengths. It composes well-crafted, coherent, and concise narrative summaries. It recognizes simple so-called textbook cases very accurately. And its speed. It took only 5 to 10 seconds per case. Its weaknesses, rare diagnoses. Its proposed diagnoses appear minimally influenced by the age of the patient, for example, suggesting a heart attack in cases of chest pain in children. It hedges when it shouldn't, saying it needs more information before it could offer an opinion when it's actually been given the entire case. And a big weakness, it sometimes does not hedge when it should, implying a degree of confidence in some of its statements despite being completely wrong. This tendency is sometimes referred to as AI confabulation, creating an intelligent sounding response which comes across as reasonable and true to a non-expert but which an expert would immediately realize is completely and utterly uh, incorrect. Also, it does not appear to incorporate any biostatistics. In other words, regarding the condition of heart failure, the bot knows that it can cause lung crackles, lower extremity edema, an S3 or a third heart sound, and an elevated JVP, but it does not discern which of these have the best and worst positive and, neg and negative likelihood ratios in deciding whether or not to propose heart failure as a leading diagnosis in a specific case. And the last weakness was something that I, I wasn't expecting, though I probably should have. There is some degree of randomness in its answers. To investigate this, I pasted the initial history from the first case of the 29-year-old with fever and shortness of breath into a brand new prompt, that is a brand new conversation, 20 different times. This was the breakdown of how often a diagnosis was included in the list of four most likely diagnoses. Pneumonia and influenza were both listed 19 times, bronchitis 14, COVID 10, RSV 8, respiratory infection 3, asthma 3, ARDS 3, and pulmonary embolism once. For many tasks that the broader public gives to ChatGPT, providing unique and non-reproducible responses is advantageous and contributes to the human-like quality of the bot. But for medical diagnosis, if the bot always uses the same data set from its training, I think we would want it to provide a consistent list of possible diagnoses when given the identical case. So my takeaway from experimenting with ChatGPT is that it performs relatively well with language-specific tasks and tasks which employ pattern recognition and performs relatively poorly with anything that requires analytical reasoning, which you know makes a lot of sense based on its design. Its primary purpose is to produce human-like language, not to solve complex problems. While it can write poetry about any topic imaginable, ChatGPT can struggle with even the most basic of math problems, which honestly feels like the complete opposite of how I imagined future AI would be like when I was a kid.
Intelligent chatbots raise a ton of fascinating and challenging questions. The most immediate question for me is how should we adjust assessments in med school? There are a couple of possible approaches. We could make the exams all in person, closed book and closed internet. But this doesn't match real life when they can use the medical literature and can use Google to help answer questions. Instead, we could make the exams harder or at least focused less on language-based skills and more on analytical skills. However, the problem with that approach, it's a short-term solution only. This technology will only get better with time. In 2022, ChatGPT may not be able to connect a history of smoking in a large cervical lymph node and a pleural effusion to suggest metastatic lung cancer. But in a few years, it or a successor chatbot might be good enough for that, particularly as people work more on chatbots that are specific to medicine. If you're thinking, oh, wait a minute, Eric, there are already a ton of chatbots uh, chat in clinical medicine. You know, that is true, but they are typically intended for a layperson user, often don't provide actual diagnoses, don't incorporate test results, and most are, to be honest, frankly terrible. What I imagine the future to look like is a chatbot specifically trained like ChatGPT, but on a handful of key medical textbooks, review articles, and thousands of published case reports to not only understand the significance of exam findings and diagnostic tests, but to also incorporate the precise prevalence of certain diseases and certain populations, and the positive and negative likelihood ratios of each symptom or finding for each disease. And the bot could do complex biostatistical calculations in real time. With all that going on in the background, I can easily imagine a chatbot exceeding the diagnostic accuracy of most practicing physicians. We certainly are not there now, either with ChatGPT or any medically themed chatbot or other AI tool. And that kind of programming is fundamentally different than what ChatGPT is designed to do. However, seeing ChatGPT's performance with these cases makes me think that we are much closer to that reality than I would have guessed even as recently as a year ago. That's hard for me to say because I absolutely love clinical reasoning, and it will be sad to see so much of that skill set eventually replaced by algorithms. Which brings me to the last potential approach to med school exams in the era of chatbots. Maybe we should just let students use them. If AI-driven tools will soon be commonly used in clinical practice from the clinician side, doesn't it make sense for us to be teaching students how to properly use them now? I know that might seem irrational for students to be allowed this technology. It very much feels in my gut that this would be cheating. And I am certainly not advocating at this moment for my own students to be using ChatGPT for their take-home exams. At the same time though, when I took my internal medicine boards a few years ago, we were allowed to use UpToDate during the exam. For the non-medical people watching, up to date is the most thorough medical reference ever. It's like taking a history exam with access to an encyclopedia. 10 years ago, that would have felt like cheating. Having access to an exam, uh, having access during an exam to a resource like up to date, which we use all the time during actual patient care, fundamentally changes the expectations of our performance. By giving us access during assessments to the tool we use in real life, those assessments of us as practicing clinicians become improved measures of our real world performance, rather than just measuring who is the best at memorizing random facts. A non-medical analogy might be to ask for elementary school students, should we still be teaching long division in an era of ubiquitous calculators? And should we still be having spelling tests when spell check is now built into word processors, browsers, Google Docs, and email clients? I don't know the answer here, at least not in the short term. However, as I said previously, there will be a time when AI surpasses the average physician in diagnostic accuracy. When that happens, after a brief period of resistance, the incorporation of AI into our reasoning process will likely become as mandatory as electronic charts are now. Why would patients, hospitals, and insurance companies 
continue to trust physicians who work without AI once AI-supported reasoning is proven superior. So in the end, students using chatbots to solve clinical reasoning exams may intuitively feel very much like cheating at the present time. As medical educators, we cannot ignore that this technology will, be, will become part of our workflow someday. And it's our responsibility to ensure that students are prepared to use it. What that will actually look like in practical terms remains to be determined, but there is only so long that we can punt this issue. Okay, so everything you just watched was actually filmed a month ago. I waited to publicly release it because I'm actually part of a research group here at Stanford, which is undertaking a much more formal, methodologically sound approach to investigating the ability of general chatbots to perform clinical reasoning tasks, and eventually to determine if chatbots can help students and residents perform tasks at a higher level than either the bots or the trainees could do alone. I didn't want to spill the beans before we had at least one manuscript out, but alas, beans are already getting spilled, and I didn't want to wait any longer. As I'm implying, a much more detailed analysis of ChatGPT in MedEd is forthcoming, and when it's ready, I'll talk on here about it more because there is a lot more to say, and I also want to be sure that everyone involved in the project gets appropriate credit. A benefit of this delay, though, is that it's given me time to reflect and to talk to several people who had an early preview of this video. One additional issue that came out of those discussions is that with ChatGPT, it's kind of impossible to dissect what's going on under the hood. Users can't audit or examine how the bot comes up with answers, and specifically, we can't see why the bot makes mistakes, not on an individual level with any one specific error. The bot can't tell us why it sometimes directly contradicts itself in the same paragraph or even the same sentence, or why it makes basic, basic math errors, or why it totally makes things up, like referring to a patient's tachycardia in response when the preceding prompt specifically stated that the patient did not have tachycardia. This is partly why I'm extremely skeptical that a chatbot like ChatGPT, no matter how many parameters it considers or how large the data set was that it was trained on, could literally replace doctors without a fundamental change to the approach to mimicking human intelligence. Neuroscientists do not yet understand how people think and reason, but it seems to require more than just mimicking the language around us, which is currently all chatbots are capable of doing. So once again, I studies or papers are forthcoming. Uh, in the meantime, I'm very happy to read viewers' comments and thoughts below on this complicated issue. And with that, I'll leave you with a poem that ChatGPT composed for my electrophysiologist wife. The heart is a complex and wondrous thing, a muscular organ that beats and sings, with its own unique rhythm and pace. It pumps blood through the body with grace, but sometimes the heart can go astray, and its rhythm can become disarrayed. This is where electrophysiology comes in, to study and understand the heart within. With electrodes and wires, they measure and record. The heart's electrical activity, never to be ignored. They seek to understand and fix what's amiss, so that the heart can continue on its bliss. The study of cardiac electrophysiology is a fascinating and important area of study. It holds the key to understanding the heart, and can help keep it beating strong and smart.